Buenos días. We're going, ahead, we're going to go ahead and get started, ladies and gentlemen, so if you can please take your seats. Oh, it is clear that I am at an education conference. That is the fastest response to please take your seats I think I've ever seen in a room of 500 people. I didn't have to say if you can hear me clap once or anything. It was, it was impressive. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marco Davis. I'm the president and CEO of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute, or CHCI, a national leadership development organization based in Washington, DC. Uh, and I'm honored to serve as your MC today for In Pursuit of Equity, Accountability, and Success, Latinx Students in Massachusetts Schools, or PEAS for short. Who doesn't love PEAS, right? My own journey spans nearly 30 years of experience in education and leadership development, ranging from working at one of the largest Latino civil rights organizations in the country, named Unidos US, formerly known as the National Council of La Raza. If you're not familiar, I suggest you look it up. Um, to more recently, working in the administration of President Barack Obama in an office named the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for Hispanics. It was a role where I was charged with increasing educational opportunities and advancing academic achievement for Latino students throughout the nation, from pre-K through post-secondary. So these experiences are part of what bring me here today to help guide your discussions on equity-minded leadership in a Latino context. And I can attest that while equity for Latino students is certainly a national topic, there's no denying the urgency for the Commonwealth, where of the public school students in the K-12 system, 19% are Latino on the one hand, but on the other hand, of Latino male, uh, sorry, only 22% of Latino males complete college. This is simply untenable in a state like Massachusetts, widely hailed as the education state which moreover has a growing Latinx population. What do we mean by growing? In gateway cities throughout Massachusetts, Latino students already represent the largest student population. This is true in Boston, in Springfield, in Lawrence, in Holyoke, and right here in Worcester. And that's just to name a few. And the more than 400, or I'm told actually I think we've reached 500, we're at capacity, of you here today know that the urgency is real. Many of you see it in your classrooms, on your campuses, and among your families. So we want to thank you for sharing your day with PEAS as we imagine what equity-minded leadership and systems mean for the Latino community in Massachusetts and for the common good. Now, I want to introduce President Barry Maloney of Worcester State University, who brings a warm welcome on behalf of the university that was generous enough to host us here today. President Barry M. Maloney is Worcester State University's 11th president. He has served in this role since 2011. His straightforward charge to put students first means providing them an excellent education at an affordable price in a vibrant campus environment while offering real-world experiences that prepare them to change the way the world works. Under President Maloney, Worcester State University has increased its full-time faculty and student enrollment. It has significantly improved graduation rates. It exceeded annual fundraising targets, increased grant support, expanded student government, community-based learning, and student exchange, as well as study away opportunities. So you can see he's a classic underachiever. <laughs> Maybe we can get President Maloney down to Washington to help out with government a little bit, being that he's accomplishing so many tremendous goals. Please give a warm welcome to President Barry Maloney. Marco, thank you so much for that introduction. You read it just the way I wrote it. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to Worcester State University standard uh, operating procedure here at the university. I want to apologize first and foremost for the parking. 
That is, that is a traditional welcome here at the university. I hope you all found parking safely on campus. It is great to have you all here on campus and it's wonderful to host uh, today's conference. It's an important day for all of us. In case you are not familiar, I know many of you, uh, this may be your first time uh, visiting Worcester State, I wanted to make you a little familiar with, uh, with the, the institution that's hosting today's event. We are one, of course, one of the nine state universities here in Massachusetts with roughly 6,200 students, 4,100 of those are full-time undergraduates. We offer 29 graduate programs and 50, 29 graduate programs and 59 undergraduate programs. Most enrollees are in business administration, criminal justice. We also offer many liberal, liberal arts programs, as well as those in the sciences and health sciences, including nursing. And of course, our corner, cornerstone program is education. About half of our recent incoming student classes are identified as first generation, and the vast majority of our students come from both central Massachusetts and the state of Massachusetts, where 94% of our students identify coming from the Commonwealth. We, we saw an increase last year, a 25% increase from students coming from the Worcester Public Schools. This was intentional, and we're very proud of the work and the partnership with the, with the public schools here in the city. Commuting school students make up about 60 to 65% of our students, and students pay roughly about $10,000 a year to attend. So we are fairly representative of the state universities, and we are also have distinct, a distinct advantage in that we are located in the great city of Worcester, a city that is experiencing a bit of a renaissance. And for those of you who drove through Kelly Square, you got to see the beginning stages of the new ballpark that is being constructed. Our, com our compact campus allows, is beautiful. I hope you had a chance to walk around before the conference. Uh, this building opened up in 2016. Our new Sheen uh, residence hall and dining hall are certainly assets for our students in terms of their, their uh, academic growth and retention. We have also improved, as you heard, our graduation rate six percentage points between 2013 and 2018, the result of consistent multi-year focus on retention. Yet, like so many colleges, the achievement gaps, especially those Latinx students, remains stubbornly persistent. That cannot, of course, continue, and we are here today to learn how to address it. Some best practices can be learned from Worcester State's Latino Education Institute, the LEI, led by our executive director, Hilda Ramirez, which is celebrating its 20th year anniversary as, as an address. Yeah, that's worth it. <laughs> LEI, during that 20 year period, has been addressing educational needs of Worcester's Latinx and Alana community. And we're very, very proud of the work that they have done. And a few years ago, the LEI worked jointly with our urban studies department and an MIT faculty to, to study Latino male achievement in urban Massachusetts cities. They, they were helped with some research funding from Balfour and the Boston Foundations. And they learned, among other things, that less than 6% of Latino young men who enter the ninth grade in this state earn a four-year degree. This simply, they call this an opportunity gap and is something that simply we cannot continue. For public higher education, we are seeing a growing Latinx demographic while the overall 18 to 22 year old demographic is declining substantially. So their success is our success. At Worcester State, the percentage of minority and Alana students has nearly doubled since I arrived, for growing from 16.4% in 2011 to 31.7% in 2018. This is great news, for, and it adds to the diversity of our campus, the thought in our classrooms, and for the opportunity to learn how to collaborate with people who are different from ourselves. But such rapid growth, of course, brings challenges that we all have, must face. Worcester State has been challenged to become a more welcoming university. In 2016, I launched the five points of action towards becoming a more inclusive campus. Now all students are taking, now all students at Worcester State University are taking diversity coursework. Our teams are addressing issues such as campus climate, responding to bias incidents, and are working on inclusive hiring and retention practices. There are also some several small, simple, impactful efforts that are also underway, such as the signage that you may have seen around campus as you walked into the building. Such work, though, is not enough, but it's a start. We are certainly here today to learn more. Now, today, we have gathered with the three state commissioners overseeing, overseeing pre-K through graduate school. My higher ed colleagues are here as well. Some of them asked me how long my speech was going to be so they can go out and get some refreshments uh, while I spoke. 
but we are they are representing the community colleges, the State University, and UMass, along with some other 400 attendees here today. But before I step away from the microphone, I did want to recognize one of my colleagues who has been deeply involved in today's program and is deeply involved in the effort on our campus, and thank Mary Jo Marion, who is, who is the, yeah. Mary Jo, originally hired uh, to be the executive director of the LDI, had, was recently promoted to her associate vice president for urban affairs, and she was, the, she was organizing this event and is also has been working with the group in pursuit of excellence, which is a statewide group working on these issues. So thank you, Mary Jo, for your work. And thank you so much, all of you, for being here today. I hope you enjoy the conference. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our, our next speaker, and he's one of those three commissioners who, who is present here today, and he's our commissioner. He is the Commissioner Carlos Santiago, Department of Higher Education, who has served in that role since 2015. He provides an overall direction to us and is helping sh shape state-level policy, such as the new equity agenda that is now being developed. Massachusetts is the first state in the nation to make equity a system-wide priority. It is rare that a leader who chooses to pursue something that is difficult is also working on something that is right to do. So, and, and I want to also thank Carlos for his skills in terms of helping to get all of us here in the room today. So Carlos, welcome to the podium. Thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for leading in today's discussion. Yes. Delighted to see so many of you here. Um, this has been a, a dream of many of us, and I know those on the organizing committee as well, to bring a group uh, together that uh, is uniformly focused on bringing good to the Commonwealth. Um, I thank our host, Worcester State. Uh, uh, my colleague presidents are here. They're doing some phenomenal work uh, as well, and clearly the, the people job. You know, a report came out this week, and the report said that inequality today in the United States is at its highest level in 50 years. Well, that wasn't quite accurate, because that only, re that report, the data for that report go back to 1970. You need to add 20 more years to that. It's 70 years in, over the last 70 years, we are now at the worst point of inequality in this country. And I dare say that inequality in this country is now threatening our very democracy. So I'll put that in a bit of, of context uh, in terms of the work that we're uh, engaging in. There are a few things for which a student has little control over. One is the student's race, and the second is the zip code in which that student grew up. And in this society, in this country, those two forces have hindered the progress, particularly among Latinx students. I'm not going to go through the data around demography. You'll hear others talk about that as well. But I do want to talk about specifically some of the things that the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education is doing to counteract that. And there are three principles that I want to highlight. The first principle, and I believe my higher education colleagues uh, would uh, support this, is stop blaming students. And, <clears throat> and many of our institutions are changing the perspective we used to worry a lot about whether our students were ready for college. And we're flipping that, and I'm not the first one to say that, and I won't be the last one to say that we flip that. We now need to look at our institutions and say, are we ready for the incoming students that are going to be coming in the next 10, 15, 20, and 30 years? So. The first principle that the department holds is stop blaming students. The second is look in the mirror. 
we all need to begin having difficult discussions around race and ethnicity and inequality in this nation. And one of the things that the Department of Higher Education is doing tangibly is we have received a grant from the Lumina Foundation to do professional development around issues of race for the entire department. 66 staff members, and it's mandatory. And once we, once that professional development is completed, we are going to do an equity audit. We're going to look at every policy that is on the books, whether coming from the legislature or from the department or the Board of Higher Education, and ask ourselves, does this policy help or hurt students of color within the context of an equity agenda? I've also been asked, so Commissioner, and this morning when we had a group of presidents and they talked about this agenda, the question was, kept coming up, resources. How are we going to fund this? Can't do that on the cheap. Institutions, our public institutions are struggling financially uh, as it is. So we need to talk about that, and I'll make some comments during the, uh, the lunch panel about how we need to approach this. Um, but we're going to do it through financial aid, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how we can uh, fund this initiative. <clears throat> and the third, the third principle is that this has to be data-driven. We have to have goals. We have to have measurable goals, and we have to know if we are moving towards those goals. This is not simply an agenda of good thoughts, good proposals, good principles. We have to determine whether we are making progress. So we have uh, established a steering committee. We have the campuses have provided membership into an advisory group so that we have communication with our institutions and that we know what the institutions are doing and we can share best practices. This initiative is not just a higher education initiative. K through 12 has got to be tied to this initiative. And I would even go further. We need to bring early education. Next year, if you have a conference, if you have a conference, make sure you have early educators here, make sure you have K through, K through 12 educators and higher education. If the three segments or three sectors are not talking to each other, we're not going to succeed because we know the first gap we see among Latinx students and African American students is at birth. It's called birth weight. <laughs> there are gaps in birth weights across groups by race and ethnicity. <clears throat> so, our long-term goals. First, to expand the opportunity and success for all students regardless of race or zip code. Second, help Massachusetts remain globally competitive by tapping the talents of all our residents. And third, reaffirm the value of a college degree and the promise of higher education as a public good and source of economic and social mobility. By your presence here today, it is clear that you are all looking forward to moving this agenda uh, to the next level. We can't do it without you. We're a government organization. We have a number of restrictions on what we can do and sometimes even what we can say. But with your support, the demonstration of that support is here in the room with your talent, with your initiative, with your ideas. I think this will be uh, successful in the long term. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, President Maloney and Commissioner Santiago for laying out the mandate, not just for today, but for the roadmap forward, uh, and for your leadership. I want to next welcome an important supporter of this effort who will share how the quest for racial equity has changed his organization. 
As president and CEO of the Nellie May Education Foundation, Nick Donahue is leading efforts to reshape New England's public education systems to be more equitable and more effective, supporting strong futures for our region's communities. He is committed to elevating the issues of racism and white privilege in our education system, as he believes that without direct attention to these social realities and their impact, our progress as a nation educationally and socially will be limited. Moreover, I've had the, per the pleasure personally of not only participating in discussions with Nick, but also seeing him speak to fellow leaders in philanthropy, and his personal dedication to this issue is palpable. So please welcome Nick Donahue. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> How are we doing? Great. Arousing. So uh, I want to say thank you. I'm glad to be here. <clears throat> I'm very self-conscious about the introduction for two reasons. Uh, one is, uh, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about where we're headed, uh, but you're more interested in the work ahead than what we're doing. Uh, but I see how it's relevant, and uh, I'll speak to that as well. Um, it reminds me of a <coughs> comment my mother used to make, or she would say, after talking about herself a lot, she'd say, you know, enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think about me? <laughs> and so uh, I want to avoid the sort of the self-obsession that comes with uh, some people, uh, that comes easily with people in my position with my privilege. The second is, uh, <coughs> I am very glad uh, to have, uh, when I heard the part about realizing that we need to face uh, racial oppression, advance racial justice, uh, challenge white privilege, and defeat white supremacy, when said that way, that uh, I thought to myself there, most of you in the audience are saying, oh really? You know, what a great new insight you've come to so late in the game. So I, I say that in jest, but uh, it's an apology. So it's, uh, these facts and truths have been truths for a long time, uh, and some of us, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the journey of, of uh, just seeing things more clearly. So uh, I'd like to just thanks to the, the group. He's glad to support this. Uh, Commissioner Santiago, President Maloney, uh, Marcos, thank you for your job and, and seeing, and Mary Jo for your leadership. Um, you know, Nellie May had been for a long time advancing an important and powerful agenda, and that was the reconstruction of the student experience in our schools. We batch process kids. They're not human places. Uh, they're defined by endurance. Uh, and their institutions that are rife with uh, institutional and structural racism. Uh, and yet we still had an idea about changing the student experience, which is a good one. Tailor to students' needs, make it more real world, uh, let the young people have one hand on the steering wheel, uh, and just understand that it's not about seat time and enduring, uh, sitting in a building that looks too much like a prison, it's about demonstrating what you can know and do. And I still believe those things. But as we advanced this mission, we saw that the ideals and the, the sort of more dramatic renditions that we envisioned to break the mold, to move a place like Massachusetts from being first in the nation globally uh, in terms of achievement, but 40th in the nation in terms of achievement gap still, to move and close that gap, uh, and it wasn't happening. And we, we saw, again, as many of you have known for so long, that uh, it was really the oppressive context, the cultural beliefs, the unchecked racism and, and whiteness that was holding things back significantly. Not the only thing, uh, but uh, a significant thing. And that we had been advancing our agenda uh, without checking those things, without really acknowledging those, with pretending like <clears throat> the ether in the air wasn't filled with a, with a struggle, especially for people of color, for people um, from low-income backgrounds, for immigrants, or for those who don't speak English uh, as a native language. So we spent a long time sort of looking at ourselves, and in today's world, that's not hard to do. A lot of people are talking about race. A lot of white people are talking about reflecting on race. Uh, but, and as a you know, good progressive liberal male, I'd been doing my work. I've been the white Irish Catholic partner in a multicultural education team. I understand how to talk about this and had been a decent advocate and ally to people fighting the fight against racism. Uh, but I'd never really checked or thought about how my whiteness was limiting this or how white culture in an organization like mine might limit the futures of our staff, the efficacy of our program, or uh, the nurturing of our souls. And uh, so we decided to make a change. And all of this conversation is rooted in privilege itself, right? So I work in an organization. We have money. Uh, we get to use it. Uh, we're accountable to a good board of people, but we have the luxury of taking time to reflect and change and, and do the things that we choose to do. So 
we've decided to sort of shift our energy outward, uh, moving off of kind of our arrogant self-centeredness uh, and come to you know a couple of different conclusions. <clears throat> and one of them is that it's just not our money. So Nellie Mae is an interesting example because we come from, our basis of our foundation support is from student loan receipts. So it's really not our money. But it's also not the money of wealthy individuals who've benefited from a society that privileges some and, and doesn't privilege others. It's, it's, uh, it's true of family foundations, it's true of all, and all good people trying to do good work, but it's not their money. It's been taken explicitly over generations and decades, uh, and it's time to give it back. So that's not gonna be an easy thing to do. Power does not relent uh, without uh, struggle. Frederick Douglass told us this, and many others have said the same. Uh, but it's a direction in which we're trying to head. So the work has led us to um, a mission around championing community-developed goals that challenge racial inequities and advance a strong public student-centered education system. Student-centered learning is still in there as an object of interest, but we're done telling people what to do. The price of admission at Nellie Mae is not figuring out how to cleverly attach your own agenda to ours to kind of talk us into the fact that we're on the same page when you actually know that you need to do things differently. So we assume and espouse at this point uh, really to uh, operate and try to operate a little differently. And my board still has to approve this finally in December, uh, but I count last Wednesday among the top uh, moments in my career. Uh, first was getting a teaching job, first and second grade uh, in Eastern Massachusetts. Uh, second was being appointed commissioner of education in New Hampshire, proud stint for me. Third was getting my job at Nellie May. Fourth was getting an honorary doctorate at a little university system up in Maine. I'm very proud about that. And last Wednesday when my board basically affirmed the direction of shifting gears and uh, not only doing uh, uh, work well, but doing the good work well. So uh, in coming December, we will be providing unrestricted grants uh, to organizations, not gigantic ones, not completely sustaining ones. We don't have enough money to meet all the need, uh, but they will be aimed toward capacity building and the, the logic model, the evaluation metric, the foundation reporting will be about the goals that uh, people in these community organizations set. They will become our goals. Uh, we will think about advancing uh, solutions differently. Um, and we, and we, we think that this is a team sport. This isn't something that we're just reversing the, the flow of funds. I've talked in my organization about it's easy to make unilateral decisions. It's second easiest to have someone else make unilateral decisions and building a real relationship and moving from transaction to a connection, a relationship and love uh, is really the way forward. Because you know what? Philanthropy is based on the Greek word that means love. The solutions piece is we're glad to advance something like student center learning, but we spent too long thinking if we just build something that we think works for everybody, maybe it will work for those who really need it most and whom we need to advance the most. And instead, we are flipping that over, taking a more focused approach, say, let's see if we can figure out things that work for the learners and the people who have had the least and who have been oppressed the most, and let's hope it works for everybody else. So, I'm going to go a little long here. I just have half an hour more, okay? It's very quick. All right, so I just want to say also, I'm very self-conscious who I am. You know, I've been doing the work. I'm not new to this, but it's a new stage for me. I'm not going to try to pretend I'm all. I'm not, I'm getting at work. I've woken up, you know, been on this journey. But, you know, being the white, privileged, middle-class man that I am, uh, I understand my own limits. I think it's a test for me moving forward. Uh, I'm glad I'm near the end of my career than the beginning because I wonder every day if I'm the leader for this work. I've been encouraged to speak this way because of who I am to people of this audience, other audiences, and uh, other folks who look like me. Um, I'm not uh, confused about the leverage or strength I'll have in those conversations, but it's an effort I'm gonna take a crack at. So I just, I hope that we're worthy of this effort. Um, I'm serious about that. You know, I don't have uh, done a lot, feel good about my career, uh, but uh, there's a long road ahead. So I'm not asking you to buy this whole hog. I'm just here to publicly witness at the effort we're trying to make so that I can hold myself accountable for achieving it. Uh, and I just want to thank you for your commitment and leadership. This is a team sport. We're going to lean very heavily to the voices of those least heard, most with the most at stake, and the most harmed by the current system. That means some of you, and it doesn't mean all of you. 
We're gonna lean toward the voices as close as we can get to the ground. But these folks need our help. They're just like us. They're, they're just, uh, they're, they're the ones we need to support. So I look forward to learning more about your effort, uh, how this moves forward. Um, this work is practical because we have issues we need to face that are rooted in, uh, in racism and white supremacy. It is morally appropriate because it allows us to live up to the values that we espouse as a country. Uh, and it's patriotic in a way because it means we can demonstrate to some other people what it means for a democracy to op operate even in the face of tyranny uh, at its highest, uh, highest offices. Uh, someone once said that children are the message we send to the future. The only question is what message will we send? Uh, and I'm just proud and honored to be in a room with people who I know are dedicated to sending a message of preparedness, community, compassion, progress, and justice. So thank you very much. Good luck in your mission. And uh, thanks for the few minutes today. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, and now for our main event, I am pleased to introduce Estela Ben Simon, Dr. Estela Ben Simon, who's going to guide us through a discussion on equity minded leadership and how accountability tools can help us reach this aspiration. Dr. Ben Simon is the Dean's Professor in Educational Equity at the USC Rossier School of Education and Director of the Center for Urban Education, which she founded in 1999. With a singular focus on increasing racial equity in higher education outcomes for students of color, she developed the Equity Scorecard, a process for using inquiry to drive changes in institutional practice and culture. The Center for Urban Education has worked with thousands of college professionals, helping them take steps in their daily work to reverse the impact of the historical and structural disadvantages that prevent many students of color from excelling in higher education. And the innovative Equity Scorecard that she'll talk about in a minute that process takes a strengths-based approach starting from the premise that faculty admi and administrators are committed to doing the public good. Q the Center for Urban Education, or Q, builds on this premise by developing tools and processes that empower these professionals as researchers into their own practices with the ultimate goal of not just marginal changes in policy or practice, but significant shifts on those campuses towards cultures of inclusion and broad ownership or over racial equity. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Estela Mara Ben Simon. Thank you, Marco. And uh, thank you, everyone else that is uh, responsible for this great meeting. And hopefully, we will get this to work. But um, as it's been set up, um, I'll tell you a little bit about um, the Center for Urban Education. We, um, we are at USC, the University of Southern California. And um, we're all set now? Okay, and are you able to see that? I hope, maybe we can lower the lights a little bit. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I was telling you about the center. We have been around for uh, 20 years, and uh, here is my staff. Um, as you can see, we um, women power, <laughs> and um, and this is also our facilitators. We um, we work with individual colleges and um, and universities throughout the country around. Um, thinking about racial equity in terms of accountability as well as um, changes in, in uh, practices. We also work with systems. And for today, since you have an equity framework, I'm going to show you a little bit of the work that we have done uh, with, uh, with Rhode Island, which is a neighbor to you. So. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention is that uh, when I started this work, uh, no one, and I hope that this microphone is off, do you think? Yeah, okay. Um, no one was speaking about equity, everyone was talking about diversity. 
And, um, and in fact, when I proposed to do work around racial equity, I was uh, discouraged from doing that. Um, in particular, philanthropic organizations felt that I should not be leading this work with racial equity because it was too, um, too conflictual. In fa and I, I, it was recommended that why don't you focus on socioeconomic status? Well, uh, I'm glad that I stuck with it because, as some of the speakers said earlier, now everybody seems to be concerned with equity and talks about it. And um, so I, um, I feel grateful that people have caught up to me. Um, so now, with the, uh, <laughs> with the talk about equity, one of the dangers is that it's becoming like diversity. So diversity became whitewashed. And, and I'm always concerned that equity is the same thing is happening. And, um, and I have actually written about that. The, the, the need for us to reclaim the racial justice meaning in the term equity. So um, with that in mind, let me tell you what I'm going to talk about. So you, uh, it, it has been pointed out that you are the only state that has um, an equity framework, an equity um, agenda. And um, now that you have it, the issue is how to put it into action. So I'm framing all of my comments. I'm directing everything towards your equity, um, your equity framework. And I'm suggesting that in order for the equity framework to, uh, to be effective, you have to have a shared meaning of equity, right? So that we don't just use the word. Um, we also need to understand what equity-minded competency is, because everyone uh, from uh, Commissioner Santiago's staff all the way down to every faculty member and staff and administrators at Worcester College, uh, State College, will need to become equity-minded. So I'm going to talk about what that means in actual competencies. And I'm also going to talk about how you can use the methods of inquiry, uh, because you're academic organizations, so inquiry is in your DNA, how you can use inquiry as a strategy of systemic and institutional transformation. And lastly, I'm going to show you the tools to do that uh, inquiry. So let's start out with the meaning of, uh, of equity. So in our center, we defined uh, equity. We always speak about racial equity in terms of three, um, three ways. One, as corrective justice. The fact is that, uh, that racial equity applies to those populations whose connection to the United States has come about involuntarily. Uh, it came about through enslavement. It came about through colonization, in the case, for instance, of Puerto Rico, uh, and in many ways, Hawaii. Uh, it came about through enslavement. It came about through the theft of territories, in the case of Mexico, and genocide, in the case of Native Americans. So, and in this particular political time in our country, this issue of corrective justice has become even more important. So I'm speaking about the racial equity agenda in higher education as a form of reparations. Um, the second way that I'm speaking about uh, equity is that it's an anti-racist project. So some of you may be familiar with a new book by uh, Ibram X. Kendi on becoming an anti-racist. And what he says is, rather than, rather than claiming that we are not racist, you know, like, I'm not a racist. I am the least racist person in the world. You've heard that. Um, is to speak about being an anti-racist. So I'm going to speak about both the use of data, the use of policies, uh, from how do we think about them as anti-racist. And, um, and I'll give you an example of that quickly, and I hope I don't run out of time. Um, in California, 
we have instituted a policy for the community colleges to eliminate all of developmental education, remedial education. It's no more. It goes, in, it goes into effect now. It was done by the legislature. So that's an example of an anti-racist policy because developmental education, remedial education, has been essentially the killing fields for uh, Latinx students and African American students and Native American students. Now, in, contra in contrast, the California State University system is trying to enact an additional math requirement at the high school level for admission to Cal State University. That is a policy that will have racist effects because math, and, and, uh, and uh, Commissioner Santiago mentioned geography. Geography also affects the curriculum that can be offered in high schools that are in segregated areas, often not of you know, providing AP courses or advanced math courses. So that's what I mean by anti-racist. And the last thing is, which the previous speaker, um, Nick, mentioned is about whiteness. We cannot do racial equity work without uh, understanding that what it's about is dismantling uh, the uh, entrenchedness of whiteness in everything we know. So that's great music there. Uh, <laughs> okay, let me go on. So uh, another way and practical way of thinking about equity, which is how we do it at the center, is as a two-dimensional concept, one of it being uh, accountability and the other one being critical. And by accountability, what I mean is, you know, how do we assess that we have accomplished equity? And in our center, we talk about different ways of looking at data, but one of them is about parity. So um, uh, I don't know the statistics for, uh, for Worcester, but let's say that 25, 20 percent of your students are Latinx, more, do you think? Yeah. So um, parity would be that when you look at graduation, you know, who graduated, who graduates in 2019, that we would expect that out of all of those students who receive a baccalaureate, 20% should be Latinx. Whether they are or not, I don't know. But let me show you how we did this, uh, how we translated this for Rhode Island. This is actually Rhode Island College. It's a four-year college in the public system. And um, what we looked at first was their success rates by race and ethnicity. And I don't want you to become overwhelmed by the table. Just look at, um, let, let's look at African Americans uh, compared to the, so the average success rate at, community, at Rhode Island College was 44%. That was it. And for African Americans, it was 7.3 percentage point lower, right? And, and also for um, American Indian students. Latinx students were over 44%. Now, the issue is, what do you do with those data, right? So there it is. What, what, where is the action in that data? And so this is what we did for, for Rhode Island. We actually calculated that if 44%, which was the average, was their goal for every group, then we calculated how many more students needed to be successful. So when you know how many more students need to be successful, it's much easier to really, I mean, look at that, look at those dates. You just need six more African American students to reach the 44% graduation rate. Six, six African American students, you can find them, you know where they are, you can do something about it to make sure that they graduate. But the question is, is 44% graduation rate good enough? No. So Rhode Island has set a goal of 70% success rate for the state. So there is what it would take for Rhode Island College to achieve that 70% graduation rate. It would take 
26 more African American students. It would, uh, it would take 26 more Latinx students. I am showing you this because in order to enact your equity agenda, these data need to be available for every single institution so that they can know what they need to get to in order to be a, by group, in order to be able to make the, uh, the agenda, in fact, actionable. So that's one way of looking at data systemically. But you can also, you need to also look at data at the, at the course level. So I hope that you can see this, but what I'm showing you is how to look at data from a parity perspective. And so here what I'm showing is, and I cannot see it here, 32% of the students who started out in Math 101 were Latinx. For us, equity would be that if when you look at the end of the semester, uh, who received A's in that course, parity would be that 32% of the Latinx students earned an A. We don't look at our data in this manner, but until we do, it's really difficult to make equity, um, equity real in terms of outcomes. So that's one thing. Now, that was accountability. Equity as accountability. Now I'm going to go into equity in, as, a critical, uh, as, a, as a critical practice. And that is much more difficult for people to understand. For people to understand that the reason why we have racial inequity is not because of the students, but it is because our practices uh, are, are, are racialized and that in order for us to get to 20% or 37% of Latinx students getting an A in that math course, we have to dismantle first how we do math, as an example. And so this, in order to think about how we could explain the critical perspective of um, of equity, in meaning that we cannot assume that our institutions are good for everybody. We created some new visuals. So you see, people think that everybody has, if they have the motivation, if they have the ambition, if they have the aspiration, they have the same ladder to um, the degree. And I hope you can uh, see this. Um, and, but the fact is that that's not true. Some have a shorter ladder because they have had, they have all of these other resources that come, as uh, Carlos mentioned, with zip code. Um, and um, so AP courses, uh, you know, scholarships, and so on. So their lather is much shorter than the lather all the way to your right hand, where the students are coming almost from under the ground and are impacted by a series of disadvantages that have been imposed on them. So, um, so one of the one of the ways of understanding this critical perspective is that the students who are in the ladder all the way to the right, that ladder is broken. And that's what this equity agenda is that you have. It's about fixing that ladder. Okay, but I have one more image here. Did something happen here? Oh. <laughs> Did the... Um, I'm not exactly sure what happened. Uh, I'm not able, let's see, to move the slides. Okay. Okay, there. So to make this point, you know, uh, re-emphasize it, what I'm showing you here is a sculpture. It's a sculpture that exists in Copenhagen. And it was a bill to represent the inequality in the world. And what the inscription, I hope, uh, uh, um, in the sculpture is, I am sitting on the back of a man. He is sinking under the burden. I would do anything to help him except stepping down from his back. Now, the point of that is, it's not that 
we would say that, except stepping down from his back. But when we're not willing to look at power and how power is used and who has privilege, that's what we're doing. So here it is translated to us. So we say, I want to hire more racially minoritized faculty, right? Um, I will support more outreach and other best practices, but I am not willing to accept that our values and preferences in the hiring process reproduce whiteness. So what I am suggesting is, is that this is what we need to recognize in order to reach the equity agenda. So, um, so here is, if you want to achieve racial equity in access, degree attainment and success, that's what your agenda is. And you need to think about what are you willing to do and maybe what is it that you're willing to give up. Okay, so that part was about the definitions of equity. Now let me go on to equity-minded competencies. So um, we have created these competencies um, to, um, to represent how we need to develop a new mental schema to be able to enact racial equity. So one is that we have to be race conscious and aware of racial identity. And Nick uh, was a good example. He mentioned that he was white. And so a lot of times people forget that racial identity includes white as well. So um, faculty members, are there faculty members in the audience? <coughs> okay, hey, Tara, <laughs> is that you? <laughs> um, Tara Parker, professor at UMass Boston. <laughs> um, so a lot of times faculty are not are not aware that their racial identity impacts the racial climate of their classroom and their relationships with students. So instead of being colorblind, we need to be race conscious. Um, and when people say, I don't see race, I don't see gender, you, you've heard that, right? Everybody's a human, right? So okay, you know, the fact is you cannot be colorblind unless you're medically uh, diagnosed as colorblind. Okay, the next thing is the use of data, which I already showed you. Uh, that's another competency. The, but the competency is to be able to interrogate the data from a racial equity perspective. Um, the next, uh, the next uh, competency is being able to reflect on the racial consequences of taken for granted practices. So like, just to give you one example. For those of you who are faculty members, maybe there are students here as well. But faculty have, you know, they, they want to engage in active learning. So they will say, get into your groups or get into groups, right? And what they're not aware of is that there are sometimes racial consequences for that because often if there are a small number of African American or Latinx students, they might get excluded from those predominantly white groups. So like wh what I'm trying to say is we have to think about the racial consequences of what, um, of what we do. Um, like the Cal State University probably needs to think about the racial consequences of an additional math course. Um, the next one is exercises agency and actively self-monitors practices to produce racial equity. So, um, so let's take Nick, for example. <laughs> you, are, <laughs> you didn't know this is going to happen. <laughs> so for Nick, you know, he controls millions of dollars, I imagine. I, actually, we had a grant once from uh, Nelly May. Um, and so he needs to be hyper-conscious all of the time how decisions are being made about grants. And, and who is going to benefit from those grants, both directly and indirectly? And, uh, and how are those applicants for those grants actually addressing racial equity? Because that is something that is important to the foundation. So that's because it's not, it's not enough to be good. 
We cannot depend on our goodness. We have to know that we might be good, like, you know, I'm not a racist, but that we're still refusing to get off the back as in my sculpture. Okay, so, um, and I think that the other, the other uh, competency is that you have to see your institutions are racialized, having racialized processes, like faculty hiring, and the classroom is also racialized. So, um, so what I'm suggesting is that we need to give up the cognitive frame that we have in academia, which is about merit, it's about uh, hard work, and uh, it's very individualistic, and we have to develop, we have to learn how to develop the, an equity-minded mental schema. Because our mental schemas, which we're usually not aware of, because they are in the below consciousness, but that's what determines what we notice and uh, what questions are asked and the kind of information that we, you know, that, that, that is collected. Uh, and uh, so, for example, I work with the, um, I work with the um, Coast Guard Academy and, uh, and recently they uh, very proudly announced that they had, uh, I don't know, 20 new faculty members. And I said to them, if you really are trying to become more equity-minded, you can't just say 20 faculty members. You have to say what those faculty members look like by race and ethnicity. You have to start showing that you are always thinking about that. So let me just now uh, here um, show you what, um, what it means to, um, to change your cognitive frame. This is the provost, uh, Dr. Leanne Nielsen of Cal Lutheran University in California. We worked with them for one year to change their hiring practices. So here she's gonna talk a little bit about culture. Uh, let's see, is this working? Do you, um, and it's very All right, let me start again. That was my experience. <laughs> and the problem of having a culture of niceness, we are a, such a nice place, we have such great values. You walk across campus, everybody says hi to you, um, and it's very pleasant. That was my experience, and I think it has been a culture of niceness for white people. What, what I didn't realize was that the experience was different for people of color because our culture was a, a culture of whiteness. Okay, so now when we met uh, Dr. Nielsen, she would have never said this. She was not even aware of it. But the way she became aware of it was through the processes of inquiry that we put them through. And uh, so I'm gonna move on now to my next slide on inquiry. And um, go, my, um, my prop is leaving. So Nick, are you leaving? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so um, this is what I mean by inquiry. It's, um, one, and I'm gonna use an example. Oh my God, just 15 minutes, I have much more. Um, so I'm gonna show you an example. Inquiry is, one aspect of it is, is being able to map uh, practices. And uh, so I'm going to show you how to map, you, how you can do a mapping around faculty hiring. But you can do this around uh, any kind of practice. So I don't want you to get overwhelmed by this triangle. I'll only focus on the right uh, upper corner and which shows artifacts. And the point that I'm trying to make is that everything that we do in artifacts, uh, policies that are in writing, um, master plans, uh, hiring guidelines, syllabi, and 
and you go on, you know, you can go on. But it all, there, and artifacts can be on paper, but they can also be in photographs, and they're also in language. Language is probably one of our most powerful artifacts that mediates learning. So what I'm suggesting is that change comes about when people like you in teams begin to interrogate the artifacts of your practices and see how those artifacts are in fact creating inequity or contributing to it. So, um, and that's what we do at our center. So we have created all kinds of tools so that people like you can study your own artifacts and ask the question, why is it that the way that we do hiring ends up reproducing whiteness? Why is it that the way that we mathematics works so much better for white students than for Latinx students? So if we were mapping, so here, so what we did at Cal Lutheran, you know, um, is, uh, th this is actually something that we created, but it's, it's something that brings about a discipline to actually looking at why your hiring process doesn't work. A lot of times we talk about wanting more minority faculty or minoritized faculty without really looking at the way that we do hiring. So this mapping enables institutional participants to see all of the places that they need to make changes to bring about racial equity. So here is an example. So we created this table. Is this is a quick and dirty way for looking at faculty announcements. And um, we have um, people take out their faculty announcements, and you can do this after today, and start out by analyzing the language in the uh, announcement. And we have divided up the language into dark gray, uh, are you seeing it? Yes, okay. Uh, middle gray and, and, and lighter gray. And the language is divided up into equity-minded language, diversity language, and deficit language. And, um, and we have, when you go through this, like I just did a, a webinar for about 500 people, and I asked them in the webinar to, um, the, I had given them homework from the previous webinar. 80% of them came back and said that their, uh, their faculty announcements maybe had some diversity, some had deficit, almost no equity-minded uh, language. So let me show you now what um, Dr. Gustavo Oseguera, he is a dean at Norco Community College. They participated in one of our institutes and, um, and listen to what he says about... Um, uh, prior to attending the Equity uh, Institute uh, for, for uh, Equity and Faculty Hiring, I do not recall us having any conversations about um, trying to infuse equity in our hiring practices. So while we've had a lot of conversations about equity in general at Norco College, we never really engaged in um, using the equity language um, in our hiring practices. So this is really what sort of jump-started our process to change the job descriptions for faculty. So what was interesting is Norco is a, a uh, Hispanic-serving community college, and as he said, we talked about equity, but we had never thought about equity in terms of faculty hiring. And I would say that that is very common. I bet that in many of your institutions, you talk about equity, but you haven't talked about it in the context of specific practices. What I'm suggesting is don't talk about equity generically. Talk about equity or, or, or exercise equity by examining your practices. So what this college did under um, Gustavo's leadership, not only job announcements, they also changed the rubric that they used to evaluate candidates. And I know you cannot see that, but here's one of the, um, the items in the rubric. Uh, in under experience required, they included evidence of responsiveness 
to an understanding of the racial, socioeconomic, academic, and cultural diversity within the community college student population, including students with different ability status and so forth. So this was that the candidates would need to show evidence that they knew how to do this. And there are many more items that are very interesting. Okay, another way in which you can map a practice is by interviewing uh, people in the department, like maybe the chair of the search committee or others who have participated in the search. This is what we did at Cal Lutheran because by doing these interviews, then you can learn. And one of the things that they learned was that there was no uniform process and that um, in some ways the, the, the process was haphazard. So that's another tool that can be used. Another one is to look at conceptions of merit and fit. So if you look to your left, those are the traditional conceptions of merit. Well, that's what reproduces uh, whiteness into, in the faculty hiring process. So you need to redefine merit and fit with equity-minded um, conceptions. So there you have them listed. I'm not going to go through them because I am running out of time. Um, and so, uh, and, and there are more equity-minded conceptions. So now, um, I, I want to show you again um, Leanne and what she says, because it really talks about what happens when race consciousness is absent. It was, 20, it was one of our largest groups of faculty that we hired in one year. We hired 21 faculty. I'm very sad to say it, that 20 of the 21 were white. That's one of the things that we looked at and said, oh my goodness, what is going on here? And when I looked back, we had an expectation that every Every search had to have at least one uh, diverse candidate. So we, we, and I think most institutions, I, I think most institutions have an expectation of that. You know, you have to have diverse finalists. So I think what's happening is that um, diverse candidates are getting a lot of visits to campus, but I don't think they're getting the offers. They're coming to campus because the committee has to have someone, but then when they get there, um, they don't get picked. Um, and so um, uh, that year when we, when we uh, hired 20 out of 21 who were white, we had diverse candidate options. And I would interview them and I was so excited about them. And then the committee, because they made the decision, they said, we picked so-and-so. And I would make the offer. And then there wasn't pushback. because It wasn't our culture that there was pushback. Now there's a lot of pushback, a lot of conversation. Um, and there's um, an understanding of what the institutional goals are. Okay, so um, I'll finish up with Cal Lutheran and I'll tell you what they did. So they engaged with us for a whole year in redoing the entire uh, hiring process. But the one thing that they did which really worked was we worked with 18 faculty members they became equity advocates, and those 18 faculty members, after one year of working with us, are actually spread out to all of the search committees, at least two of them, so that they become like the equity anchors in these um, in the search committees. And it was a way of beginning to change the process. The outcomes have been amazing. You, know, you heard that she said, you know, at that year that they brought us in, 20 out of the 21 candidates were white. I would say that now it's the reverse. And uh, because people have developed new, um, new uh, competencies. Okay, so I only have five minutes left. I was gonna tell you about our work in Colorado. This is about math. Uh, we work with the community colleges there and it's a whole project on how to uh, address inequity or to how to produce equity in math courses. And I was going to show you the kinds of tools that we have created for that kind of work. It, it includes you know, how to review your syllabus, your syllabus and how your syllabus can become a tool for, um, for supporting racial equity. Um, how to 
uh, code your grade book as a way of seeing patterns of attendance, homework assignments uh, submitted by racial group and how that can bring about a change in the mindset of faculty members. Um, so I don't think I'm going to um, have time. Um, I'll, I'll speak about the grade book um, coding. So here's a grade book. It's, um, and you, what you can see is in the column where you would see the students' names, what you see is the racial identity of the students. And across in the, um, in the rows, what you see are different symbols that, uh, that indicate attendance, homework, uh, tests, and quizzes. And the symbols indicate whether the students were successful or not. And, um, and we have um, a faculty member here. Let me see if I can just quickly show you. A faculty member who did this, and, um, and I'm only going to show you at the end of it. Let's see if I can do this. So first he, when he, uh, first he found out, let me see if I can, um, OK. Uh, first he looked at his own data, and this was one math class. As you can see, um, the success rate for Latinx students was 33%. For white students, was 80%. So the question, then from that, he went and did the um, grade book as a coding to see if he could figure out maybe what was going on. Why were Latinx students uh, not doing as well? And what he found was that they had perfect attendance, but they were not submitting the homework. So that was hurting their, their, um, their success rates. And I'm going to go towards the end, if I can see this. <laughs> OK, let's see if that works. So awesome, they might email me, but it's that, now I can I kind of get that feeling that they can talk to me uh, more, I can talk to them, we can understand what's going on in the classroom more. Um, I feel as though they're not just a student at the back of the class that I don't know what's going on with. Expected this from a 33% success rate and looking at that thinking, I probably know that, um, sorry, I hope that's not popped up. Uh, hopefully I know that those students who might have dropped the class uh, in the past, um, they're showing up there. So it may be that I, because I wasn't following, well, I wasn't talking to the students, I wasn't getting to know them, weren't getting to know me, that they were dropping from the class and therefore, you know, that shows that a lower success rate for the Latinx students. Um, whereas now, you can see that um, I've got a large percent that are successful. Uh, they are now as successful as my white students. And I think it's because I am talking to them. They are feeling part of the class. Um, I am talking one-on-one. -on -one. We're working together a lot more. They're not just some student that I don't get to know and maybe drops out of the class after five weeks or isn't being as successful. Um, so I'll stop there because of our time. Um, oops, what did I just do? OK. Um, Welcome, everyone. My name is James Gray. I am mathematics. OK. So what he did was he changed one practice, well, two practices. He started the homework in class rather than telling them go home and do the homework. And that had, a, that had the impact of showing students that they could finish the homework. And the second thing that he did was he established specifically relationships with the Latinx students. And that changed his way of thinking. Now, I have to tell you that Jason was very resistant to our work when we first work started out with him. And with that, I am out of time. And <laughs> but I think that you can ask questions. And um, I, uh, I had a very inspiring conclusion with a Martin Luther King quote, but I'll, I'll leave that. And, um, so I'll open up for questions. Is that right? Do I have? I don't have time for questions. Oh, okay. I th what? No, I'd rather have questions than than do the inspirational closing. Um, so, um, are there any questions? 
Do you think you can do this on, on your campuses? What do you think you need to do it? Uh, anyone? Yes, go ahead. I think that there's a microphone, isn't there? I'm at Fitchburg State University, and we are about to hire new, two new professors in the education department, and I feel like I need time like to sit down with you and look at those scorecards, um, you know, the, the equity and hiring information you shared. So can I get that information? <laughs> I mean, this is going to happen soon within the next couple months, so I feel a little pressure. Yeah, I mean, um, we can provide you with the, what I showed, and then you can do your own uh, analysis of those announcements and show because I know I'll be on the hiring committee, and that would be really helpful. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. And you can email me. Super. Yes. No. Uh, we don't work with public school systems because we're not, we don't have the expertise um, in, um, in K through 12. So we have stuck to what we know. <laughs> Do you know of any organization that actually will work with the, with the public school system? There is no organization that works like us. OK, so then maybe you should <laughs> consider moving into the, Worcester pub, I mean, into the public school system. Because I think if we're going to be feeding our students of color into uh, higher ed, we have to have them graduating from the public school system. And here in our city, we have a major problem where our people of color, students of color, are not being acknowledged and are, there's no equity. So in order to get to here, we need to address the inequities, the racial inequities that exist within our institutional public school systems. Um, so. When I said that there's no organization that works like us, what I meant to say, and not that I was being arrogant, uh, but to say that, we are probably unique in, uh, in framing the problem as a problem of practice that needs to be deconstructed using those inquiry tools and then reconstructed. And most people, or mo most initiatives around equity tend to focus on how to fix the students, and they also focus on best practices. So, we are not about best practices in our center. We are about best practitioners. And so that's, that's what I meant. Yeah. So I think that they want me out of here. And Marco is coming to, <laughs> to make sure that I step down. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Ben Simon. And uh, as you can clearly see, there's, we could spend the whole day just talking with Dr. Ben Simon. But um, there is good news, however, which is that the breakout sessions allow you to go deeper and allow you actually to, to have further dialogues exactly about the how, about ways in which you can uh, improve practices. And in fact, some of the breakout sessions are focused specifically on the K-12 education system. And in fact, our afternoon speaker, the renowned Pedro Noguera, um, is also uh, specifically focused on the K-12 education system. So there's many more opportunities, I think, to continue these dialogues across both um, sides. Um, we need to get to the workshop sessions now, and as you can imagine, we're run as you might have realized, we're running a little bit late, and so we're trying to sort of adjust and shift. So I wanted to give you all an update on the schedule for you to take into consideration. Uh, we're going to break right now and go to the morning breakout sessions that are now going to begin at 11.30 p.m., and they're going to go till 12.15, so that same 45-minute time slot. Please don't leave yet. I have to give you the instructions on how to, where to go. Um, we're going to break from 11.30 to 12.15 for the breakout sessions, and then we'll meet back here promptly. This is an education conference, so I know we can do promptly at 12.30 uh, to begin the luncheon uh, panel that we'll have, and then we'll try to get close to back on schedule, or we'll have updates for you on those, um, on the new uh, schedule if we need to. Uh, and so now, please select the workshop you would like to attend, 
Uh, and what you can do is you can follow the students who are holding signs in the back of the room. If you look to the back of the room, you'll see they're holding convenient signs for you that list the name of the workshop topic you'd like to attend, and you can basically follow them so that you don't get lost on your way to the session. Thank you very much.